In this video, we're going to talk about transformational leadership and well-being. The type of leadership in an organization will obviously impact employees, and that's what we're going to talk about today. Hi there, I'm Andrea Adams, and the host of HR Shop Talk. On the show, you get expert insight into all things HR. I encourage you to subscribe to the show or to the podcast to keep learning from my smart and experienced guests. Today, my guest is Ryan Rex. Ryan's currently doing a doctorate on leadership, and he's been a manager and director in the area of HR technology and transformation. Hi, Ryan. How are you? Good. How are you doing, Andrea? I'm good. I'm good. Looking forward to learning about leadership today. Excellent. Uh, so we're going to talk about transformational leadership specifically. So can you tell us what that is and how it's relevant to an HR audience? Yeah, sure. So transformational leadership is really a set of behaviors, and these behaviors have been proven to foster better engagement and health in the workforce. So it does that by focusing on the followers' interests and their needs. So it's more of a bottom-up approach than a top-down, and through that, create productivity and profitability for the organization. So from, from a theoretical standpoint, because transformational leadership is really one of the leadership theories, and just as a background from an academic standpoint, transformational leadership is really the most researched leadership theory. There's a lot of empirical studies that have talked about why does transformational leadership work, how does it work, and how does it impact employees, and why is it good for organization? So it's really the basis of a lot of leadership writers. They use it, so a lot of leadership books that you see will reference transformational leadership, and leadership development programs. So either organizations that are developing those out or organizations that develop them internally typically focus around transformational leadership behaviors. Uh, one thing I do want to address is that sometimes there's a misconception that transformational leaders are there just to execute on some big changes within an organization or to lead transformations. And that's certainly one thing that they're very good at doing, certainly a part of the portfolio. But the other way that the word transformation applies is that it's, it's also a transformation of the individuals who work for that leader. So they go through a process of development, a process of self-actualization, and they become better and become more or achieve more on their career path under a transformational leader. So two sides to that transformation coin, one of them on the organization, one of them on those followers and, and what they experience working for a transformational leader. So now I'll, I'll kind of chalk it down to you ask me, well, what's the definition? What are those key behaviors? And we call them the four eyes. Okay. So the first one is idealized influence, and that's how charismatic the leader is. They're, they're typically exhibiting ethics-based leadership, and they create themselves into a role model that people actually want to follow and, and should follow. The second one is inspirational motivation. So they're able to clearly articulate a vision and so that, that people really understand how their work and their role contributes to achieving that vision. The third one is individualized consideration. So the leaders look at all of their employees or all of their subordinates in a unique individual way. They're thankful for the differences between the teams and, and bring that together and allow everyone to feel uh, equal at the table as well for, for what their contributions are and, and the value of those contributions. They also look at development in a different way because not everyone has the same career path. Not everyone wants the same thing out of their career. So they look at development on what's, what does that individual need to attain? And then the fourth one is intellectual stimulation. So how do they keep the team challenged and keep the team constantly developing, building new capabilities and new skills? And this is where some of those tough conversations come in too, because mm -hmm. transformational leaders are not just nice people and, and people focused people, but they are gonna, they're willing to have those tough conversations as well for the purpose of the benefit of the individual. Mm -hmm. I think that the second part of your question there was, now, why, why would HR? care about transformational leaders and why is it relevant to them, right? And yes. there's a number of accountabilities that we have in HR that I think uh, transformational leadership behaviors can kind of underpin. And a few that, that kind of come to mind first is, you know, the HR BPs, when they're out coaching some of their clients and understanding these behaviors and coaching a leader wow. through some of these yes. behaviors, yes. I think would really help that individual leader, their, their clients execute for their business the way that they need to. Right. So 
The other one that I think too is talent and learning, <laughs> obviously leadership development. So building out leadership development programs more targeted around some of these core behaviors instead of very broad. I find a lot of leadership development is, is quite broad, cover, cover a little bit too much. Um, and then finally, how do we reward uh, leadership behavior styles and, and make sure that we're fostering the right culture for the organization. So what, is, what does that look like in terms of total rewards and, and engagement from that perspective? Mm -hmm. I have so many questions. <laughs> sure. You talked about uh, leadership theory and, and that transformational, leery, uh, transformational leadership is a predominant leadership style. Can you just, just for contrast, what are a couple others? The ones that we hear a lot about a lot are like authentic leadership. And okay. you, you get some of that through vulnerability with a researchers like Brene Brown bringing that in. Okay. Uh, you also hear about task-oriented leadership. So how do we get really minute in some of the management and make sure that people are clear on exactly what they need to do and, okay. and managing that through. So I don't look at these as, um, as completely different. Like I don't think mm -hmm. of, Andrea, you are a transformational leader or you are an authentic leader right. or you are a task-oriented leader. Right. It's kind of, these are elements and behaviors in your toolkit that you're going to draw on depending on the scenario but really what we're finding is transformational leadership makes up the bulk of that toolkit. And there is a lot of overlap to some of these other theories too. Like okay. in authentic leadership, you'll see a lot of, of similar behaviors to what transformational leaders exhibit as well. Okay. To paint a clear picture and maybe, you know, to some extent you've already done this by talking about those other leadership theories, but what is the opposite of a transformational leadership leader? Yeah, that's... That's a good question. And, um, you know, I, I kind of mentioned it. It's the tools that you're drawing on at the time. So I think that even a transformative leader or someone that, that typically exhibits these behaviors can sometimes slip away from it. So it's what, what do those look like? So when I think about transformative leaders, you know, typically they're driven, they can create clarity, they can create vision. But if that's too strong and you have you have this vision that you're so focused on achieving, how do you bring others in to be able to critique it or give feedback to it or provide new ideas to it? Mm -hmm. And so a transformative leader is going to bring people along and say, you know, we can adapt this. We want it to be uh, representative of all of our ideas, not just my idea as an individual. Yeah. But if I'm too focused on my vision you know, are other people going to feel comfortable being able to critique it or, or provide in other ideas? Mm -hmm. There's also, so that that's maybe how, you know, one mechanism that you would say, well, that person's not quite behaving as a as transformative leader. Now, there are opposites. So there is a, a theory in, in leadership. It's called the dark triad. And there's three behaviors that, that go along with that. I know it's, it's quite, it sounds, quite negative, like, it sounds like the dark night or something. <laughs> yeah, exactly. um, and, and there are three, three um, behaviors that are assessed under that. And it, it's not to say that all these behaviors are bad necessarily, but when they're amped up too high, they do become negatives. And those behaviors are, are narcissism. So, you know, focus on oneself and what, right. what I'm achieving, not necessarily concerned about the rest of the team. Right. Machiavellianism which is really the ability to manipulate. And, and sometimes that manipulation is not always a positive thing because we always, we bring the business along as HR, right? We want them to come mm -hmm. along our talent journey. And so that's not quite manipulation, but it's more about, um, you know, communication and making sure that everyone's aligned. That Machiavellianism is a little bit more uh, nuanced than I would say maybe negative than that, that you're, you're yeah. manipulating for your own good. Mm -hmm. And then the last one is psychopathy. I've seen this in the business before, not that it's, it's, you know, this negative thing that we would see on TV, but it's when leaders operate in a way that they don't necessarily care or consider the feelings or impacts to the worker for, to the workers. So, you know, they are more out for themselves. They're willing to say, you know, the business needs this, the business needs us to cut 10%. So we're cutting 10%. Let's just move forward with it. You know, th those types of behaviors aren't really considering the impact to individuals. And I think that that, that can be an issue when it's turned up too high because the leader's not, not then looking at the business. Okay. So talking about that, sometimes, you know, businesses get in a position, I mean, COVID, where they have to cut 10%. How do you do that without being a psychopath? Yeah, this is, this is really, it's a dilemma, 
And I think that a lot of leaders would um, would would think to their experience in that dilemma because it's happened a number of times. You know, uh, a number of industries are hit, so I don't think that it's industry specific or, or anything like that. But you're you're put in a position where we need to protect costs for the organization, and if the leader just focuses on nope, we we got to do what's right for the business, then then you're not really seeing transformational leadership behaviors. Mm-hmm. If the leader is more in tune understanding what those impacts are for the individual workers, how like is is there burnout? Are people close to going on short term disability? How is it impacting their their personal lives? And telling that story to the decision makers that hold things like budget. Uh-huh. Now the flexible part is really the portfolio of work. So what I like to coach more executives on, and and for for leaders having to make this decision, it's how do they have these conversations with the executives, is how can the portfolio shift temporarily to give some capacity relief to the team? So if if there's 10 things that we've committed to, how do we maybe remove two of those and not say no, but just say not now? All right. If you found this inspiring, subscribe to see all the episodes. And the question of today is how have you seen a leader impact the well-being of a team? Tell us in the comment section. We're talking about that already now. So transformational leadership impacts employee well-being. So how do you define well-being and how does uh, transformational leadership make a difference there? Yeah. So the, when I think to that, the the role that work is playing in our lives is shifting a bit. And what we expect out of work is shifting. Like this, this burnout has been in the, the workforce since back in like the start of the four days in the assembly line, like, and before this, the five day work week, right. And, and the two day work week or weekend. So, you know, it's kind of always been there, but I think now people are not tolerating working in that environment anymore. So we have, we have a bit of criteria that we're bringing to the table. So one of them is people want to be their whole self at work. They want to be authentic to themselves. They don't want to have to change who they are, change how they look, change what they wear to go and, and, and be able to execute on their profession. And they don't want it to limit them. Having a fulfilling career is very important to people right now and, and doing meaningful work. So, and, and, you know, there are great jobs in, in HR that are more administrative and, and you need a certain mind frame to be able to do that. So for some people, those, that work is very rewarding. So it, it's not just a matter of changing the work itself as well, because um, we're talking about a lot of, a lot of automation, that, but just people finding internal intrinsic meaning in, in the work that they do. They also want purpose alignment. So, you know, I want to be able to live my purpose as an individual, and I want my organization's purpose to somewhat align, maybe not perfectly, you know, we can't, we can't all work for those organizations that are going to change the world, but, but have some level of alignment and attachment to the purpose of the organization. So all of that said, what that's doing is creating positivity in our life, and it's promoting a greater sense of well-being for us. And, and through that, when we're clear on the work that we need to do, when we know how we're being rewarded, and we feel valued by, by our leader, um, our stress is reduced. And, and so therefore, you know, we're having better balance. And I don't just mean in hours of work, but better balance between what we want to achieve in, in work and what we want to achieve uh, in life. So when I think about this, you asked about the definition of, of well-being. Yeah. It all plays a role. And there's really three things that we look at to define well-being of the worker in the workplace. And the first one is uh, positive feelings. So in the moment, how are you feeling valued? How are you feeling even connected to your boss or to your team or to your workplace? Do you feel good about the work that you do and the goals that you have and and how you're going to about about achieving those? Are you having fun at work? So that kind of those feelings of of positivity and they're very, they're very in the moment. The next one that we would measure then is the feelings of negativity. So, you know, what are those days that when, when you're feeling like you're, you're just not connecting to your work or you're not connecting to your boss or to your team or, or to the organization anymore, it doesn't feel like a fit, you might not feel rewarded uh, in terms of the value that you're creating from your position, um, you know, the, and, and that creates unwarranted stress levels as well. So, it, it, you know, definitely there's physical symptoms of that, of, you know, increased anxiety, less sleep, yeah. increased yeah. heart rates and, and that as well. So, but, but both of those things, I could feel great on one day, maybe a little bit more challenged the next day, or I could feel, you know, challenged for four days and really great on, on, on a Friday or something like that. So they're very kind of in the moment. The last one looks more at feelings over time. 
and growth over time. So when I look back to the last month or the last six months at work, how am I thriving at work? Do I, do I feel like my relationship with my leader, my relationship with my team and, and organization is doing well? I look back and I feel like I've made some great contributions. I look back and I feel like I'm developing over time and my career is going in the direction that I want. So really looking more at a long term rather than a, a fleeting in, in the moment piece. And so when we define well-being that way, how does the transformational leader drive it? Well, right. they do have a lot of ability to influence the environment that their team sits in. So regardless of the environment of the organization, the transformational leader has a lot of control over the management systems in their team, how their yeah. team interacts, how they're doing informal or formal reward mechanisms and yeah. recognizing the team and yeah. the relationships that they're developing with those individuals, the whether they're building a culture of acceptance and that psychological safety. So you've been researching this for a while. What is one thing you've learned that surprised you? Mm. Yeah, yeah, maybe... Maybe one thing that I'm still thinking about from a okay. research standpoint. So yeah. I, I've read I've read literally hundreds of empirical papers on trans, right. all leadership behaviors and 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 employee well being and and how they relate to one another. And two papers stand out for me that identified that when transformational leaders are are creating this passion for vision, that it can actually decrease an employee's willingness to speak up. And we kind of touched on that earlier uh, mm -hmm. in the conversation. And I don't think it's that when we measure it, we measure would that individual feel comfortable applying critique or, or uh, uh, you know, giving ideas to, to the transformational leader. And they always say yes. That, so that's been proven. We, we have empirical studies that, that, that say that. But what I wonder and I'm curious about and I'm, I'm hypothesizing around is, they might feel comfortable doing it, but will they do it? Will, if, if you see a leader that you respect entirely, you want to follow them, oh. they are very excited for a, a path forward and, yeah. and very excited and creating a very clear North Star for everyone to kind of, of work towards. And they're yeah. building an energy in the team and in the organization or around achieving this mission. Yeah. And you're thinking, but something's not quite right. And what I know in my work, I think that we may need to tweak something. Are you going to be willing to say that? Or, or would you maybe think, no, my leader, he like they must already know that. They, they must already know the issue that I'm thinking of. They must have already thought of another path. And this uh, is the path that they've landed on uh, because they're so smart and they're, you know, they're so charismatic and great. Yeah. So what I worry about is, you know, is that, and I, I believe uh, very deeply in employee voice. I think a lot of times the yeah. answers to what's going on in an organization sits in the, or we just need to talk to people and not just listen, but hear them mm -hmm. and actually apply what they're saying and, and maybe make some tweaks to, to the path that we're on. Um, but I, so I, I, that, that I think is a bit surprising to me and something that I might take my research down that path a, a little bit later, but uh, have mm -hmm. some research on the table that I need to get through first. Final question here. Uh, what are some takeaways for HR from your research? Uh, I might've touched on a, a couple earlier on in our discussion, okay. but I can kind of elaborate on those because I think that th this is very key for the HR function to kind of rally behind and okay. use as, as one of those threads uh, through different services that we deliver out of HR. Um, and the first one, uh, you know, it always goes back to because we're talking leaders and we're, we're talking about how do you coach and develop the skill set within leaders is uh, uh, that HR BP alignment. And, you know, and it's not about, you know, we want to make sure that all leaders know that they're exhibiting transformational leadership behaviors. For me, when the, when the BPs are involved in those coaching conversations with their clients or they're, they're helping their clients navigate through some, some difficult times in the business. And maybe it's the BP, maybe it's the HR advisor. It's, it's different depending yeah. on the right. model of, of the HR department. Right. Um, but how are they using some of these fundamental behaviors to coach their leader to exhibit those behaviors? Right. So if we're dealing with something, maybe there's, there's a leader that's having an issue because the team is constantly saying, you know, I don't, I don't quite know. I'm not, I'm not quite happy with my work or I don't quite know how it aligns. 
how do, how do we coach that leader through creating a real vision and a crisp vision and 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 on an individual level talking to each one of their workers to to tell them and to and to help them create that mental alignment between the work that they do and the organizational goals and objectives the next one that i i maybe touched on earlier as well is in total rewards and i think this is probably a really big important one okay but what behaviors of the organization are being rewarded either through annual incentives right. uh, promotions okay. yes. you know what, what how are you seeing individual leaders succeed at your organization yes. and what are the behaviors that they have because we all know that you know in every organization there's that one leader that we say like how did they do that they're they're not a great leader they're, they're maybe, you know, not exhibiting the best behaviors. Yeah. People might be scared or intimidated by yeah. them. So, you know, we don't want to reward those behaviors. Certainly we want to coach them because I don't think that there's any bad person. I don't think that leaders yeah. are, yeah. are trying to intentionally be, yeah. you know, negative to their teams, but yeah. they just might not know how to apply some of these. So what are we rewarding? And that leads into how then do we instruct or structure annual incentives so is it more focused on the what someone achieved or the how they achieved it? Uh, um, and then promotion criteria and succession planning. And yeah. how, does, how does the behaviors play a role in some of those services that, that total rewards or, or the talent uh, deliver? One more that I, I really do want to touch on is around leadership development. So uh, I've, I've had a great opportunity to be a part of amazing leadership development programs, including one six-month program that was uh, a co-collaborated with Harvard, Harvard Business School. And my challenge around these leadership programs is that they are far too broad. They try to give leaders just, you know, 20 different tools that you can draw on for any diff given scenario that you yeah. might be in around change management, you know, work organization, and then certainly, yeah. you know, feedback and, 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 and uh, team dynamics. And, you know, what, what we're doing through our research uh, and with the University of Calgary is we're trying to focus on what are just those key, maybe two to three behaviors that make about 80% of the impact mm -hmm. for the individual in that relationship. Mm -hmm. And then how do we build leadership development programs that go very deep into those two, behavior, two or three behaviors? Thanks, Ryan. That was so interesting and, and uh, kind of made the whole topic a little less daunting, or for me anyway. Uh, I did an episode on career development in HR, and that link is right here. Thanks for watching and see you next time.